I'm going to talk about on several timescales, and uh, I'm trying to focus it really because part of the Cabot's um, brief is to actually think about uncertainties and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, the about risks that we have in government, how we deal with it, and then I want to sort of talk rather more generally about what's happening to the world, really. Um, and uh, so let me jump into that. Um, one of the sort of problems of uh, my job of the last five years is that pretty much any audience that I speak to knows lots more about the subject I'm going to speak to uh, than I do. And um, I have to say that this is no sort of deprecation of this audience to say that I feel slightly less nervous talking to you this afternoon than I did when talking to some people in the physics community about how um, nuclear fusion could be generated by the use of lasers. Um, this was slightly outside my domain of, in, of uh, information, but um, so thank you. Um, let's jump in. Um, the way that government deals with risk, and uh, first of all, um, we have, the government has a thing called the National Risk Register. And that does two things. It looks at the likelihood or the chance of an event happening, and it looks at it five years, and it, rank, it puts these events on a, two, on a two axes. Essentially, on the bottom axis is the likelihood, and on the, um, on the vertical axis is the um, impact. And I've, the, I'm going to talk about some of these issues and how we actually deal with them um, in the first bit of the talk. Um, to give you a clear idea of it, and um, it's illustrated in red on the right-hand graph, is that pandemic influenza is seen as not only the highest likelihood risk, but also the one with the largest impact to affect society as we know it. And I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, there are some other um, risks, and we uh, other risks here are things to do with, for example, severe space weather, something that you will be less familiar with than pandemics, volcanic eruptions, and indeed coastal flooding. And so this is the way, this is in a sense the way the government plans five years ahead and thinks about how it can actually mitigate, um, uh, prepare for these actions, have some degree of resilience to it, and making certain that we actually have planning in place that we can deal with it. Now, how do we actually assess these risks? And risks are of different sorts. The ones I'm going to talk about this afternoon are very much the risks that come from um, natural hazards. Things, so we have information from historical evidence, weather forecasts give you predictable events, we have expert advice. In the world of security and counter-terrorism, we also have to be thinking pretty hard about um, the uh, potential threats that terrorists can actually provide. And there, as opposed to using historical evidence, we, have, we use other factors. We think about plausibility, um, intelligence about capability, intent and vulnerability. And these are the sort of things that, in fact, in our national risk assessment, there is essentially divided into two things, the, natural, the hazard um, and the risks that come from natural events, but also those that come from actually the impact, the uh, threat that actually comes from essentially terrorist associated groups. And of course, there's sort of wider ones where we actually think about uh, the potential of state, imp of state intervention too. And one of the ways that we actually, so that's, uh, we try to assess the likelihood in these two ways. Clearly, the threat issues that come from counterterrorism are slightly less grounded in science in fact, massively less grounded in science than those to deal with uh, historical events and the likelihood of events. But in terms of impact, the sort of things that we have are what is the likely impact in terms of fatalities, uh, casualties, social disruption, economic effects, and, and uh, psychological ones. So that, in a sense, is the two sorts of pieces of evidence that go into developing the National Risk Register. Now, as I said, um, one of the first things, um, the most um, concerning threat, um, and this I inherited when I went into government, was the threat of um, some form of pandemic. Um, and influenza is uh, one that we have a history for. The sort of, the, this gives you an idea of the different strains of influ the influenza virus that have actually given rise to quite significant epidemics and numbers of deaths. Um, the Russian influenza outbreak in the later turn of the 19th century um, was probably the first one that we was, has any form of recording 
of the act. In fact, a Hong Kong influenza in, um, in the, just at around the turn of the century, and the largest that we've actually seen, which is the Spanish influenza, which occurred at the end of the Second World War. And of course, we've had others since, the latest being the swine flu. Um, I think the, uh, just to give you focusing on swine flu, and I'll go, go on to that in a little bit more in detail, you'll notice um, that each one of the um, previous epidemics has actually got some form of geographical um, reference. And uh, the very first phone call I uh, that came to me um, when the swine flu um, came out was a request from the farming community to say, could we not get this designate as designated as Mexican flu? <laughs> because the pig industry are extremely worried about this being called swine flu. So, yeah, you know, the, such is the life of the, uh, of the chief scientific advisor. And indeed, the swine flu epidemic was really quite intriguing. And we, we, when I say we were enormously lucky, I truly mean this. Um, it was first noted in Mexico in early um, April. And by the first couple of weeks of May, it was in about 40 to 50 countries around the world. Um, and the early information that we were getting was quite a lot of mortality in groups, uh, pregnant women, rather tragic, tragically, not so much the one with the very young and the very old, but there were quite a lot of deaths associated with this influenza. And we knew nothing about it. It was a genetic composition which had not been seen before. We had not expected it. The worry we had was that this was going to be somewhat similar to uh, bird flu, which actually had, um, a, you know, had not actually moved from human to human transition. So once we got this influenza epidemic coming with swine flu, we had to take real, real care in dealing with it. And here we come to one of these sort of actually, you know, part of my job is quite, was my, quite sad, but there are occasionally light moments in which um, the uh, then health secretary said, well, you can say this for swine flu. Um, it managed to close Eton College, whereas a hundred years of socialism has failed to do so. <laughs> and... Um, the, uh, and actually there's a case because actually we learned a lot from Eton College because Eton got swine flu in a big way and the college was closed, a number of staff and lots, lots of the pupils actually went down with swine flu. Um, and, but we were able to actually go into the college and take blood samples and find out what proportion were actually showing symptoms and what proportion had the disease. And in fact, for every person who actually showed symptoms, eight people had actually had the virus with no symptoms at all. And that clue, which didn't come until late July, um, gave us the clue that we actually did not have a real problem on our hands in terms of something that was terribly serious. Um, we there have a mortality rate of people who had the disease, therefore, of less than one part in 10,000. Um, so we were incredibly lucky, though tragic deaths occurred, um, and we dealt with the disease. But to give you a flavor for it and why we think this is something that we continually need to worry about, is that of the people who get um, bird flu, um, transmitted not human to human, but from birds to humans, 60% of the people who get it die. So we were on a one in 10,000 death, whereas it's 60 in 100 were the, were the things that we were really fearing. So that was one of the worries we have, and it's why it's still right at the top of um, the, uh, uh, right at the top of our national risk register with the highest likelihood and the highest impact. One of the things I'll um, take you through is that um, <coughs> these, you can see the relative frequency of this disease, so part of the job we have to do is to say what is the probability of this happening, but obviously the severity is highly variable. And we have to worry because actually there's a lot of disease out there. And this <coughs> gives you a pattern from 1980, so the last 30 odd years or so, in terms of different human and animal diseases. Um, <clears throat> many, I won't go into detail, it's rather a busy slide, but it gives you a feeling for the number of new diseases that are actually emerging. And only in the last two years, we've had the, Sch the Schmallenberg disease, which affects cows and sheep. And we've actually had, and I think there was something in the, um, in the newspapers this morning about a completely novel coronavirus which actually is killing a large proportion of people but is currently not contagious. So the variation that we have to expect is going to be enormous and we have got to expect 
new diseases will come, whether it's new diseases of humans or animals, or as indeed I've indicated at the top here, also very new diseases of plants. And Paul referred to um, the, uh, the disease of ash trees that came in um, during the last year. Um, so this is this, and one of the problems we have is our vulnerability has gone massively up. One consequence of the small world we live in, this shows the, um, the density of air travel. And you can actually get a very good approximation once you knew that the, um, the disease that swine flu started in Mexico and spread to the USA of quite where it's going to occur afterwards. The pattern of air travel gave you a very good idea of where it's going to come next. And this is a consequence of the small world we live in, that there are going to be all manner of the, that things will not remain isolated. The expectation is a new um, flu virus will develop in Southeast Asia. Um, that's the expectation. We were totally wrong. It developed in Mexico. But the expectation is that this would be around the world pretty much within a month. And SARS, which, sort of, um, which occurred in 2005, six, um, was around the world in about three or four weeks. And these things are going to happen, and we're going to have similar issues um, in terms of animal diseases. And there are new animal diseases coming, and new human diseases coming the whole time. So this is going to remain high up on our national risk register, and we need to be thinking about ways to actually mitigate it. So that's, as it were, the, the, the biggest one and a big worry. Now, the one we got here, and there's a number of people in the audience here, I can see Willie Aspinall here, um, and helped us with this. We had um, the, um, we had the problem with uh, a volcanic eruption um, in 2010. First thing, that, that, that this was an enormously irritating disaster that I had to deal with, because no, I do not believe any human being, unless they were born in Iceland, can pronounce the name of the volcano. Um, <laughs> Um, so a name that has something like 17 consonants to one vowel is actually quite challenging for anyone except for an Icelander. So the first thing about it was that I had to use, learn to sort of refer to this volcano or the volcano in all interviews on the radio and the TV. Um, but this one is a, is a kind of odd one because, first of all, um, we had... You know, there are, you know there's, a, there's a truism that there are a lot of volcanoes in Iceland, and we got it wrong, really. But this was really quite problematic. The, we reckon um, one and a half to two and a half billion pounds was actually cost. Um, Ten million travellers um, were affected, most of whom wrote to me complaining. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, and there was a real problem, and we probably should have got it thought about this rather better, because we could have predicted this. Um, we really got it wrong in terms of the National Risk Register. The um, give or take, um, the historical eruptions um, in, uh, in Iceland occur about 25 per 100 years. Um, if we go back um, substantially into history and, with, and looking at um, historical records and so on. So give or take one every four years. And there is a... There's, some periodicity here which complicates it which is shown in the bottom graph but we now have we had the uh, situation that we really should have done done it and there are a lot of um there are a lot of volcanoes out there in the world and the top right graph shows it most of them i should point out are pronounceable <laughs> i can pronounce katla i can pronounce laki so if that comes along let it be i I have no concerns with it. At least I can pronounce the damn thing. But we put this here in terms of the um, analysis of, um, of what would be the likelihood and what would be the impact of these. Um, so that was, in a sense, what happened. We should have had it in the risk register. We didn't. And it caused enormous disruption. But actually the disruption was caused not so much by the volcanic eruption itself, but by profound stupidity. And the profound stupidity was to do with the regulations. This was uh, some mapping that was done by the, um, by the Met Office and the, and the Aviation Authority. And the reason was is that the regulation, because there had been problems of planes flying through ash, which had then um, had en engine failure, not many, but there had been, the regulations were framed in saying, if there is any ash in the air column, you cannot fly. Th you cannot fly. So you cannot fly through this, whatever it was, tiny, tiny concentration or very significant. 
And that was the actual regulation. And that was the regulation that was first brought in to actually close down most of the airports in, um, in um, North e northwestern Europe and the UK. Profoundly stupid regulation, because the basic physics says, what's the concentration, how long do you fly through it? Because that's going to be the, the genuine risk to the planes. But it was there. And we realised that as soon as we started dealing with it. Um, I'll come to the SAGE process in a moment. But we, we, I was asked to chair the Science Advisory Group in Emergencies. Um, I co-opted experts on volcanoes, uh, Willie Aspinall, Steve Sparks from here, and Matt Dawson, um, to, uh, and others, to actually look at how we could actually predict it. And what came out as actually was the predictions weren't that bad, important to get information about what, how, much inf how much ash was being generated by the volcano, how high it was going, linked in with Met Office maps and so on. But that we were able to actually say, look, these are the zones. But of course we had the profoundly stupid problem that um, any ash was not allowable. Now, how do we deal with that? Essentially, the, what the, so the Met Office in their models had got a model which said essentially um, 10 to the minus 18 grams per meter cubed was uh, seen as zero. Now, you try, and we wanted to move back from that. So you can imagine the ease with which I was able to explain to the cabinet that actually we were going to redefine zero. <laughs> And that we were going to redefine zero as being from 10 to the minus 18 to 10 to the minus 16. And um, uh, this was um, challenging, I think it's fair to say. But we managed to do it. And that meant that we moved from um, the areas that uh, were are shown in black to the areas that were shown in, gr in grey and allowed us to essentially reopen the airports. And the regulations have been improved sig subsequently since. Um, the the problem, though, is that actually the explosive um, eruption that we had last it had in 2010 occurred, of course, to do with a massively increased vulnerability. The expansion of air travel in the North Atlantic um, has, has been enormous, um, therefore, and the skies in the North East Atlantic are, of course, extremely crowded. And this, this meant that the vulnerability went up. But th that volcano um, is not the only one um, likely, and indeed, the one that we have on the National Risk Register that really worries us is something that um, occurred about um, 300 years or so ago, 350, um, was the eruption of Larky. Um, note I can pronounce it. Um, and the, this is an effusive reaction which puts a lot of noxious gas, in particular sulfur dioxide, into the atmosphere, produces acute health effects, Lots of people died in the late 18th century. Big problems did disrupting crops. It lasts for um, a long time. And it still has a 4% chance of happening in about tw in 20 years. So this is something that we really do worry about. And this will have be a significantly more problematic event than the one that we got from the volcano. Um, so. <coughs> You'll notice I've also done some calculations, which I'll come back to in a moment. The chance of no further eruptions in 20 years is less than 1%. So this is something that's pretty likely to happen on some timescales. The other one which you may know less about, um, because we haven't had an event, was the, um, is severe space weather. Effectively, what happens in space weather is that you get sunspot activities, that you get a, um, and that can produce a whole series of things, solar storms or coronal mass emissions, essentially producing either intense solar, radi solar radi radio bursts or um, electromagnetically charged particles coming to the Earth. Most um, the, the graph on the right-hand side shows um, something that came out from a sunspot on the Earth in last year, about well, just over a year ago, in which we were incredibly lucky because actually it missed us. Um, the emission comes out, it basically hit the Earth a glancing blow. If it hit us direct, we would have a real problem. And the problem is that it's disrupted. So I'll go back to the frequency, and this takes you there. How often can we expect these sorts of events? They're linked with the solar cycle. They are linked to, and they operate typically on about an 11-year cycle. And you get major storms quite often correlated with a predicted maximum. This slide was done in... Um, was, came from a chap called Mike Hapgood, 
who wrote early in 2012, Mike is at the um, Rutherford Appleton lab, and I looked in a jaundiced way at the likely predicted maximum of solar activity, which coincided with the opening of the Olympic Games. Um, it did not happen, so, you know, my, um, my prayers uh, for intervention worked. So that's the sort of, that's the thing that we have to deal with. We need to be thinking about how we deal with it. Because the, um, the disruption from space weather is on several forms. First of all, big problems with airlines and big problems with the GPS signal. And the GPS signal is particularly important because it, in fact, it allows from the financial markets through to the rest of uh, industry to have a very good time stamp, to have an idea of what temporal sequence is. Very important. If you don't know when a particular financial trade has been done, pretty difficult to get some proper regulation of it. Regularly, several times a year, you get a diversion of, of flights which are around the foal because there's, a, an, in, there's a, an interference with high frequency communications. And also there is the potential with a coronal mass emission or a strong magnetic storm that you will actually get a disruption of the power grid. And the latter one um, I'll come on to in a, little, in a moment. I think the problem here is that, first of all, GPS, very important, but you can do things with satellites. You can think about alternative time um, monitoring. You can think about moving um, satellites into less vulnerable orbits. You can think about turning them. Airlines you can divert, but power is a real problem because the disruption to the power grid depends on the magnetic field that is associated with the coronal mass emission. Now, what about the early warning of this? Well, we know that there's going to be, a, we, we have satellites which will tell us that something has happened on the sun, something is heading towards us, we have about a 17, 18 hour time delay, know something that's going to be, hit, going to be hitting the earth. We also know that, whether, whether, you know, and increasing accuracy um, from our satellite monitoring of whether it really is going to hit the earth or miss us or give us a glancing blow. So we have about 17 hours to say it. The problem is that in terms of our national grid, it depends on the magnetic field of the emission. And if that magnetic field is orientated in one direction, um, asynchronized with the grid, then it'll wipe out the grid. Um, the early warning we have from that is 40 minutes. So you can imagine an interesting conversation I will have with the Prime Minister in which I say, well, Prime Minister, we have a coronal mass emission um, heading towards the Earth. It, all all this, the indications are that um, it will hit us, so we have, we're needing to take some care with polar flights and orient, reorientate the satellites. But the big worry is that this will actually have an effect on the national grid. I wipe it out. And so we have, may have to sort of uh, boost the grid or turn it out and, he, and uh, with consequent effects. On, the, um, on society. And he says, okay, when will I know that? And I say, well, not much before 40 minutes before it happens, Prime Minister. I'm very glad to say that that is not a conversation I've had to have. And I'm very much looking forward to how Sir Mark Walpert will deal with that issue. <laughs> and indeed, one of the sort of delights of these, and I've been showing the, um, the frequency of the, the expected frequency of these events, um, chance of a volcanic eruption, a chance of an effusive volcanic eruption, a chance of, a, of an epidemic, a chance of a space weather event. And all of these have, you know, probabilities that you can assess. You know, they don't seem too frightening. But if you actually ask a diff question a different way and say, what is the chance, and I do focus it on Sir Mark Walpert, what is the chance that Sir Mark Walpert will have five years without at least one of these events um, happening? Uh, I'm glad to say that it comes out at a very satisfactorily small number. <laughs> the chance, so essentially you move from the chance of 25% of, of a volcano per year, what's the chance of five years in a row without a volcanic eruption? It, it, it decays off. You move in the, jar, in the science jargon of P to 1 minus P to the N. So I've calculated and I sent Mark a little note about it saying um, you've got a, at least 3.5% chance of having, um, going through your five-year term as chief scientific advisor without having at least one of the following events. Um, uh, he didn't reply actually, I thought it was slightly <laughs> odd. Um, but that is the sort of risks that we look at. And one of the things that we have a sort of bureaucracy 
for dealing with, with um, these events is that you will have heard of the Cobra Committee, um, has this image of um, a striking snake, the swift reaction of government, the Cobra Committee moves in. It actually has a slightly more prosaic thing, as I've indicated in the acronym, is that this is the Cabinet Office Briefing Room A, um, which is not quite the, um, the speed of lightning of a snake if you've ever attended meetings in there. But we have a scientific advisory group in emergencies, and I was glad to say that I'd been uh, long enough in Whitehall to realise how important acronyms were. So when the Prime Minister, and this was Gordon Brown actually, asked me to, have a, to set up a, a mechanism for providing a, have a science advisory group, I very wisely said, Prime Minister, more than happy to have a science advisory group, but in emergencies, I think. And so we agreed that. And so in one stroke, I was able to move from the acronym SAG to the acronym SAGE. <laughs> thus giving the sort of uh, import to our discussions that I thought was important and uh, um, such things are, um, are the way Whitehall can work. Um, what we have in, in SAGE is we have some government scientists, we have input from, non, from industry and from academia and for each of the, um, the emergencies I've dealt with we've had, we have had this advisory group. It's transparent and its advice is published, people can criticise it, people can go in and that, that meets and essentially reports and the little, um, little photographic insight inset is to the Cobra briefing room which is all um, um, done and the SAGE meets and reports into Cobra and so on. So that's the sort of bio mechanism and this is how we actually deal with emergencies when they actually happen. Now the, one, the most difficult one that I had to deal with um, in my time was actually a combination of things and this was the the terrible tragedy that occurred in northeastern Japan with the earthquake followed by the tsunami followed by the disruption to the, nuclear, the Fukushima Daiichi power plant and what I was asked to do by the Prime Minister was to say um, is it safe for the embassy to remain in Tokyo? Is it safe for our nationals to remain in Japan whilst this uh, problem is occurring at their nuclear power plant. Um, and so I pulled together a group of experts and we looked at, and this is a very important concept, is the sort of what we call a reasonable worst case. And the worst case we looked at was all the reactors that were live would actually have a meltdown, there would be explosions, radioactive material would be put into the atmosphere, that would coincide with weather which was taking the radioactive material in the direction of Greater Tokyo. And that was, we saw as a, a reasonable worst case, it could happen. Um, the answers when we did it, when we, used, uh, w when we worked with colleagues in, in, in modelling and monitoring and in the health thing, was actually there was absolutely nothing to worry about. In the, even in the very worst case, the amount of radiation that would actually reach populated areas, and certainly Tokyo and the area uh, where the embassy was, was tiny. I made a terrible mistake here in the sense that I likened the dangers to eating 40 bananas and I've been persecuted ever since by the banana industry <laughs> the, who have claimed that I've effectively ruined their, their business by using this analogy. I am only thankful that um, I did not um, say it was like taking a holiday in Cornwall um, <laughs> because I don't think I would be able to move west to Bristol after that. Um, but it was, it was completely extraordinary because in fact when we were giving the advice into the British government, um, and we cooperated a lot with the Americans and actually the French, at just the time we were saying there's nothing to worry about, the French were evacuating their embassy and flying all their nationals out, the Germans were evacuating their embassy and flying their nationals out, the Swiss were doing the same, a number of other countries were doing the same, and it was nonsense. There really was virtually no danger from the, uh, from the radiation. And in a sense, the media took this up. And just look at the sort of nonsense that we actually came. Following this, which actually had no effect um, in terms of anything serious, um, and 30,000 people died from the tsunami and the earthquake, but Germany took a decision to close all its nuclear plants, and therefore is, and I'll get on to climate change in a moment, is therefore using a lot of coal to uh, generate its power and throwing a lot of greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere. 
Japan itself took a view very early on, and I think in a sense you can understand that, to do some phasing out, the Swiss agreed to phase out nuclear power. Something that really does need some scientific input. Um, so I gave, I, I looked at the literature, and of course the worst disaster that has ever happened in, nu in nuclear terms, there have been others, was the Chernobyl one. And a colleague, um, Jerry Thomas from Imperial College, looked at the basic epidemiology here. Um, following Chernobyl, there were 28 deaths from acute radiation sickness, and that was entirely due to the people who were doing helicopter pilot work, um, firefighters and so on, who were just there. Subsequent, there had been 15 deaths from thyroid cancer. Some of children may have picked up thyroid cancer, and there is an expectation of perhaps another 60 deaths if we look at it. No, in, no problem on fertility or malformations or infant mortality, no in issue on adverse pregnancy increments, and there's no in issue of heritable effects. Compare and contrast that with the sort of hysteria that there are hundreds of thousands of deaths, which you will read about from NGO literature and read about people who are against, the, uh, against nuclear power. Nuclear power is a question of economics and social views and political process is fine. But the evidence points to the fact, even in the very worst case, um, you've not, uh, there has been relatively small numbers of deaths involved. And in the case of Fukushima, um, the World Health Organization subsequently did some analysis which completely vindicated the, the, what we'd been saying, that the amount of radiation was tiny and that there's not going to be any observable increases in cancer above the natural variation. Very clear, very unequivocal. But there are some groups that do not take into account scientific evidence. This is what Greenpeace said. Greenpeace said that the World Health Organization's report is a political statement to protect the nuclear industry. It's outrageous. This is, you know, you were talking about some of the top epidemiologists and radiation health specialists in the world working on that and trying to think about what actually happened. And we have an issue there. We've got to have nuclear power, which is properly safe because, you know, it is major disruption. But in terms of the basic epidemiology and the effects of radiation and Fukushima, nothing compared with the disruption and the problems that were actually caused by the earthquake and the tsunami. So now I've got to cheer you up no end. Um, let's look at, go back to the National, news, um, the National Risk Register. And the ones that I've circled in yellow are ones, and I'll read them because uh, the, the slide is a little unclear. Um, it's coastal flooding, inland flooding, drought, storms, gales, heat waves, and uh, low temperatures, including heavy snow. Those are all on our National Risk Register, and every one of them is moving to the right, i.e. becoming more likely and more severe um, due to the effect of climate change. Um, and I, I can spell Tewkesbury, but only with a little bit of an effort. I, I forgot the RY. Um, uh, these are the sort of climate-related events that, um, that, are, that are happening. It's very difficult to attribute a particular climate event to these things, but one thing that we can be absolutely certain about, and I'll expand on that a little um, in the next bit of the talk, is that these elements of the National Risk Register are becoming worse. Uh, they're getting worse over time. Climate change is happening and it is making the, these events both more likely and more severe. So that's the sort of short term, moving to the long term as we think about how climate affects our National Risk Register. Now I want to move to a sort of slightly long time, longer time scale. I want to think about the world um, and what's happening in the world. And I make a claim here that in a, key, in, in a number of key ways, the next 20 years are already determined. The first one, and I'll, I'll expand on each one of these, is population increase. We, in 30, in uh, just 12 years' time, there'll be an extra billion people on the planet. Um, demography is uncertain, so it may be 11 and a half years' time, or it may be as, hard, as, as, as much as 13 years and one month's time, but there'll be another billion people here. Um, urbanization, 2010, first year the urban population exceeded the rural. And the expectation is that about 55% of the world, as we go out to in 13 years' time, 12 years' time, will be um, in urban environments. 
The other what fourth one is a bullet point, but I think that what we are observing, and I think this is a good thing, is that uh, prosperity, that there's a, a burgeoning middle class community um, in the developing world, particularly Asia and South America, but also coming increasingly in Africa. Um, and that middle classes will have desires for consuming more. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And climate change, um, there's important delays in the climate system, which mean that, um, that, what it, that the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today will drive changes up to about 2030. The climate system is such, it has time delays. The accumulated greenhouse gases will drive that climate change for about 20 years, and that determines the weather. So if you think about it another way, the weather we're experiencing now comes from the greenhouse gases that were in the upper atmosphere in about 1990. So if we extrapolate out, we're going to see changes in climate. Error. So let me expand on a couple of those points. Population. First, the table gives you a flavour of it. Seven billion people in, give or take, November 2011. Um, probably early November or, 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 um, or late October, beware of spurious accuracy. But another eight billion as we move to 20, another, another increase of about a billion by 2025. That's going to be split pretty much equally between Africa and Asia. And Africa will be where the most dramatic change is occurring. You're going to see about another 500 million uh, inhabitants of Africa in 12 years. And that means the population increasing, and the brown shading shows an increase from about a billion at the moment to about one and a half billion in uh, 12 years' time. And in Asia, uh, another half billion um, will come, but it, it, on a population which is much larger. So it's going up from about four billion to four and a half billion. And these are on spectacularly short timescales to think of the scale of what is actually happening. And there's other effects that are happening. So urbanization is there. The top right points to the fact that in 2010, the urban population exceeded the rural. And indeed, the world's rural population is expected to have reached a peak around about now and to be declining, whereas the urban population, the green dash graph, is expected to increase. Um, thinking about the urbanization, um, you get some feeling that the developing world will build a, a city of about a million people every five days. Um, putting it into parochial terms, let's think about Africa, 500, uh, half a billion people, so 500 million people in 12 years' time extra. The expectation because of urbanisation is that will be about a thousand cities the size of Edinburgh in 12 years. This is, I think, completely extraordinary. And of course, the urban populations are more vulnerable to shocks, natural hazards, supply of food and utilities and so on. And one of the things that is actually happening as a consequence of the demography is actually people are living longer, which is a good thing. Um, the, but ba major increases in people above 65 expected in the developing world, again a good thing, but real problems in terms of vulnerability to hazards um, as we think about our world community. And one of the problems is that the expectation as you move out to the urban world, move out to the world into 2025, the red dots, so this, the very large red box, are essentially urban conglomerations of more than 10 million. Small ones are about a million, one to five million and so on. I think you can see that the concentration of urbanization is very large, to a good first approximation, is around the coast. And of course these coasts, coastal areas, particularly in floodplains, are going to be extremely more, much more vulnerable to the issue of climate change. And the thing that is inexorable, which is changes in the level of sea, the increase in sea, um, sea surges, and other factors. So let me now move to climate change. There's a lot of talk in the media from climate skeptics. It's not happening. There is what I have termed before what I call saloon bar science. People are looking out the window in January and saying, God, it's damn cold out there. What's all this nonsense about uh, global warming? Um, and uh, I suppose a, a dignification of that is, um, is, occurs, but not by that much, I believe. But we need to be thinking that climate change, first of all, there's no sort of 
killer questions or killer facts that affect climate change and our assessments of the science of it. There are millions of observations go into it. Let me just show you one. This is the deviation from, the, uh, from what we, it's called global temperature anom anomalies. That is mean you take an average period for and you compare a particular year um, with that average. And the three years that are illustrated, for those of you in the back, are 55, 65 and 75. And red on that graph shows that this is much higher temperature than the average, the blue is lower, and, the, um, and white is about much the same. So it looks at three sample years, 55, 65 and 75, compared with an average of the previous couple of decades. Uh, you see a few things, like there seems to be some red up in northern Canada, um, which is indeed um, the sort of predictions that you might you'd come out of climate models, that the Arctic is more vulnerable than anywhere else in the world. But let's just look at the last five years. The difference in terms of that temperature anomaly, and remember this is millions of observations. This is not somebody looking out of the window of the saloon bar and the dog and duck. This is millions of observations made independently by many, many scientists throughout the world. And this pattern of climate change is, you know, I think it's, it speaks for itself. Now, the consequences of it, the political consequences, the economic consequences, indeed the detailed geographic things are problematic. But it is, it is, there is no doubt it's happening. And attempts to deal with it in terms of the climate change negotiations um, have been really not very successful. There was a lot of hope as we moved to the Copenhagen meeting of the parties. Um, hope in Cancun afterwards, then subsequently in Durban in South Africa and then finally in Doha. And essentially it's not at all clear to me that there will ever be agreement, um, an internationally binding agreement. There is an agreed target, but what are targets for if you don't actually take, a, take an action? The key is whether you're going to get reductions. And it's very important, the time delay issue, and I'm going to flip through this, it's too complicated, but the, I thought very quickly is, if you think that the weather that we're experiencing now in 1990, uh, sorry, the, w the weather we're experiencing now was determined by the emissions in 1990 that had accumulated, the weather that we're getting um, in 20 years from now will be determined by the emission accumulated to date. And as the, la the longer it takes to delay that, um, the more that our climate will be altered and therefore our weather will be al altered as we move out of the century. This graph um, from, um, is slightly complicated, but forgive me, but basically the, the green bits are the scenario uncertainty. Do we act? Do we change things? Um, there's some fundamental uncertainties in the model, which is the blue thing, and the, uh, there's an internal variability. The sort of jargon is that this is a sort of um, climate as a chaotic uh, ensemble. But what it's saying is, as you move out, you don't really get an effect of the scenarios, i.e. do you cut back on greenhouse emissions or you uh, continue to increase them. You don't get an effect for about 20 years, which is the point that I'm making. Now, one of the accusations that comes about the scientific community who work in climate and working in meteorology is they would say that, wouldn't they? That way they'll get more promotion, they'll get more papers in nature and science, they'll get promoted from uh, lecturer to senior lecturer and from lecturer, senior lecturer to reader and then reader to professor and indeed some of them may get elected to the Royal Society or uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering or whatever. Um, that's kind of the snide play the ball comments that you actually do get from time to time. So one question I posed is to say, well, what does industry think about it? Now, the top graph comes from Munich, a reinsurance company, Munich Re, um, and they've been looking at disasters. And I'm sorry, there's not a, there's, um, the key on this is not, has come, not come out. But the red are essentially geological disasters, things like volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis. Um, the red shows disa natural disasters monitored, monitored by this reinsurance company, and there's no trend in the red. You know, God's plan for the universe is we get a, r a rough frequency of disasters driven by geological events, which has got no trend over the last 30 years or so. By contrast, and um, 
There are a variety of, of, of weather events, um, and I'm sorry about there's no coding here, but the green, the blue, and the yellow all point to severe weather events which are actually occurring, which are increasing. And the economic losses, which were calculated by the World Economic Forum, are, um, are shown in the bottom thing. So industry, and it, particularly the industry that has got to think very hard about risk and catastrophes and the potential for natural phenomena to produce this, is saying, actually, we don't have to worry much about um, geological events because they're pretty much constant over time, so we can make our provisions. But in the case of events that are caused by weather, they seem to be increasing quite significantly. Of course, there's a, other issues to do with vulnerability. And one of the things that is really dramatic, and I'm sorry, this is the only bit of mathematics that I will show tonight, <laughs> is that as climate change occurs, and this is both data and also models, um, you have an increase in temperature or an increase in rainfall, but the variation about that increase is, is actually going at, is increasing at double the rate of the average. So if the average temperature is going up at some rate, the variation in that average temperature is going up at twice that rate. And what that means is more heat waves, more cold spells. In the case of rainfall, it means more floods, more droughts, put very simply. And that variation is happening and it's actually part of a series of observations. This paper by Hansen has documented that from, for a whole massive variety of um, different observations. And just to give you a flavour for what one of them looks like, this is the summers in Texas. Um, the, the plot here is on rainfall against t average temperature, and the blue dots all show essentially the last 100 years of temperature and drought and rainfall measured in Texas. That's the, uh, that's the 100 years, and 2011 um, is the one that you see um, pretty much outside the realm. Um, very, very low rainfall, very, very high temperatures. Now, it's very difficult to attribute a particular weather event to climate change, you know, because these things are naturally variable. It's very difficult to do that, though you can do some approximation. And the work that the USA has done, um, colleagues in... Um, the USA have done, looked at that and said that if there was no cli that climate change meant that this event, which was once in a couple of hundred years events, is probably like something like 60 times more likely because climate change has happened than if, it, if there was none. So what that effectively means, you're turning a, a one in 200 year event to a one in four year event. That's the sort of pattern you have. And we have a nice parochial example. We remember 2012, the, uh, the, um, the Secretary of State for um, DEFRA um, declared there was a drought in, um, in April and uh, no causal mechanism implicated. But um, we then had seven months of the heaviest rainfall we've seen in about 50 years. And I think it's ind indicative to actually think about it. This was done in October. Um, um, by, in fact, the Environment Agency, in which um, a colleague, uh, a senior colleague from the Environment Agency, has actually sat here. Um, that was the current month, in October, and looking back, look at the previous seven months to that, exceptionally high rainfall. Looking back, the previous 12 months, not quite so big, and if you looked at the average for the previous 24 months, it's pretty much what a, you know, pretty much the average. So what we actually have, if you if you ignore the the monthly variation, we would come up with something. Oh, it's pretty much average in 2011-12. Um, but actually, if you look at the pattern, it was completely exceptional. As most of us who suffered living in England during um, May through May through September, October, will well recall. So intriguing, and these these things we have to ponder. Now, I talked about the failure of the negotiations and the failure of to actually address this. And I am really depressed about this because, as I pointed out, with the time delays, and this is a complicated graph, but basically the graph says emissions are continuing to go up. The chances of meeting a two-degree goal are becoming more and more unlikely. And we have an issue that unless there is some decision, not just to cut um, greenhouse gas emissions or reduce them, but actually to seriously cut them back, chances of meeting any form of target around about two degrees is extremely 
um, extremely unlikely. And I have an even more pessimistic view in the sense that I find it very hard to believe that our economic system will adjust to this. Let me show you a graph which thing. This is a, there's three things. Let me focus, first of all, on the bottom left slide. The bottom left slide, and you may wonder why I've singled out Minneapolis, D Dallas, and somewhere in North Dakota. Well, the North Dakota, this is light, this is, a, this is a, um, a satellite image taken at night of light emissions from the, uh, from the American continent. And by light emissions, you know, cities, of course, produce a lot of light at night. The Bakken formation is, the ma is a major, but not the only, area for shale gas production. And shale gas has brought an enormous um, drop in the cost of energy in the USA. It's a quarter of, the cost of energy in the USA is a quarter of what it is in Europe. Massively affect on the economy uh, of the America to their benefit. But actually shale gas is so cheap now that actually the gas is a, is a waste product. And this is, um, this is shale gas being burnt off because what they are actually after is oil, which is more valuable. So to give you a flavor of what is actually happening there, that is one shale gas bed where they're burning waste shale gas and producing enough um, light to be, to be comparable with medium-sized US cities. That has happened, it's happened in the last year. This was a slide, this was taken I think in um, February by NASA. Big worry. So that's one real issue that economics will drive it. Shale gas actually has reduced American emissions um, because they've moved from coal to um, shale gas temporarily, but it's now a waste product. The second one is slightly ironic, is that part of the, uh, the Arctic is vulnerable to melting and the Arctic um, uh, uh, to heating, and there's been a lot of uh, reduction in ice around the Arctic, particularly um, the sea ice around Canada, and that is opening up and it's ironic, potentially huge um, Arctic resources of, um, of oil and gas. And I think it unimaginable that that won't start to be exploited. Um, they will become available with global warming, and so you've got a positive feedback that companies will go in and exploit it. I think it's unlikely that there, that there will be the sort of concerns about environmental damage and the, you know, the, the oil spills and so on. I think compared with, but that is un unrecovered and, un and undiscovered proper oil spells and colleagues around here are working on that. And finally coal. This is showing the coal reserves in the world. Um, as you can see the blue means lots of reserves, the white means not much and so on, the pale blue. Massive reserves in the USA, in, um, in, north, in um, northwest and eastern Europe, massive, dis massive reserves in China and India and Australia and South America and so on. I find it unimaginable that these reserves will not be used. The, I find it unimaginable, so therefore we have to be thinking about some technology which actually will make, can make coal more benign. Carbon capture and storage is one, and saying, okay, take the fact that, um, that we're going to have, we're going to use a lot of coal, um, and take the fact that we are going to need to be, therefore, having some way of reducing the carbon dioxide. So there's this is going to be some of the issues that we're really going to have to affect direct in the next decade. One th intervention is geoengineering, and I know we have experts in, um, in uh, Bristol on geoengineering. This is just some work from the Met Office in which they looked at the potential of actually using ships to provide mist in the North Atlantic. And they said, suppose we intervened and essentially misted up the North Atlantic um, so that incident sunlight and energy would not actually get to the Earth. What would that happen? And they did some experiments, slightly busy graph, and uh, I won't but simply explain that you have a, um, that if you do that, um, you will actually temporarily reduce greenhouse gas, and reduce um, the climate change effects, but actually if you stop it, you'll recover almost the identical trajectory. Now, other interventions will be slightly different, but it, it, I think it points to the fact that we really um, can't be complacent about this because geoengineering is not going to solve all your problems. And other things, and I was talking to colleagues from Bristol today, one of the other things that has happened is there's a simple physical, pro physical chemical process 
that CO2 um, in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, interacts with um, seawater and um, actually absorbs a lot of carbon dioxide, around 30%. Um, but the effect is on effect on the acidification of the ocean. Um, it's also an interesting way in which you can use lies, dam lies, and statistics. If you have an ex axis which is, which is um, denominated in millions of years, you can show something really pretty dramatic falling off a cliff when you come down to um, the 20th century. And uh, this is a trick that I've noticed the geologists use a lot. Um, but uh, being realistic, um, we have a real problem uh, with uh, ocean acidification, lots of effects on marine ecosystems, on coral reefs, effects on, uh, and coral reefs, for example, about a billion people depend on coral reefs for their. We need to be thinking about that, the reverse time scale of this, and uh, talking to people who know far more about this than I this afternoon, the reversal effect is going to be hundreds of years. So, and as you can see, um, that uh, we are probably the most acidic oceans we've had for about 25 million years. And what are the consequences of it getting worse? And it will get worse because the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has not stopped. And there will be a, a, a and there's nothing going to stop that. It's a chemical process. So that's the other thing to cheer you up. And I'm going to finally move and really cheer you up now. Um, one of the people, one of my, uh, somebody once commented that the only thing to do with a John Beddington lecture is to have a drink afterwards. <laughs> Um, and indeed, I'm glad to see that, see that drinks are planned afterwards. Uh, you know, the uh, university has clearly taken the right decision. So let me move to these. Now, I'm going to go through these quite quickly because I think I'm uh, slightly overrunning on time. Am I poor? Uh, just slightly. Slightly, OK. Well, I'll go through them quickly. Look, the other challenges to the world are poverty. We've got about a billion people who are hungry and another billion people who don't get proper nutrition. We've got about a billion people who don't have, have um, clean water access, and uh, rather more than a billion people who actually have, um, don't have access to uh, appropriate energy. State of play is worrying. So that essentially repeats it, but it makes two points that we actually are losing a lot due to weather uh, and extreme weather, and that land has been degraded, and that we have poverty, and we are wasting uh, large amounts. Let me move on relatively quickly. The problem is, is as we take people out of poverty, their consumption goes up. So the wealthier you are, the more you eat, in terms of meat, for example, or general food, or the more you want to consume in the way of energy. It's the dilemma. We need to alleviate poverty, but we need to be thinking about that, and it will affect it. And if I summarize it, the demands on the three key resources, food, water, and energy, the increase in demand expected out for 20 years or so um, from the OECD, that's the developed world, um, is essentially flat. For the developing world, it goes soaring in terms of the demand for energy. Much the same applies to water. There's an expected deficit going out about 15 years or so. Um, we're looking at a 40% deficit in terms of water, and that is going to be massive. And we also have a real problem in terms of food. Um, the deficits that we're actually looking at food, um, the, uh, I've just used wheat and maize as an example, but many other crops would show the same. We've been pretty successful. Agriculture has improved the yields in tons per hectare quite dramatically. But if we're actually going to meet that demand as you go out, um, you're going to have to see a radical change from that simple linear increase. And do we need to care? Well, we have need to care for lots of reasons. First of all, um, the, um, we'd seen in 2008, when I, took, when I took over as Chief Scientific Advisor, we'd had four decades of declining real food prices. We had a food price spike in 2008, and um, about 100 million people went into poverty as prices rose. Um, I remember at the time I said this is due to pressure from population, from consumption and so on, and the economists said nonsense, it's, uh, there will be a supply response, they'll plant more crops, the price will drop. And of course it did, but by 2011 you had a problem again, and f wildfires in Russia and declines in productivity in Ukraine meant that actually we had the biggest increase in, in food prices on the, food, on the FAO food index that we've ever seen. Again, why should we care? We are a wealthy country. Uh, we can afford to buy on the open market. Well, this is a 
an interesting study which stops in 2011. But it compares food prices to political instability. I, I've, st I've stopped it before the real development of the Arab string, the Spring. And it points to the fact that you get more civil unrest, more riots, more deaths from these riots, particularly in urban environments, the higher the food price is. Now, I wouldn't want to draw much more, you know, it's a correlation, but it actually makes sense. And I think if you look at a, a more detailed analysis of the history of the Arab String, points out that we have a, a real issue there. Um, so instability is generated by, it will be generated by food, this is food prices, but water, lack of water, lack of energy, and poverty in general will lead to instability. So to sum up, looking at the next two de less than two decades, this is the thing that's happening, this is what's happening in the world. We're going to get a billion more people, much more people in cities, a more prosperous world, but further strain on resources and lots and lots of poverty still, complex demographic trends and so on. And in terms of summing up in the table at the bottom, we, got, we need about 40% more food, 40% more water, well over 50% more energy. And if we don't do anything to alleviate greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to see something like a 40% increase. Now, it's a perfectly reasonable question to say, well, we've had all this before, the world population has increased, you know, what's actually happening? Um, you know, what do we ha what's happened? You know, oh, you know, Bennington's rabbiting on in his usual gloomy way. But what happened um, to the... Um, what about the past? Well, actually, the past has been successful. There's a massive failure in the past to think about natural capital, ecosystems, by whatever, the importance of ecosystems, and the linkages between food, water, and energy systems. So I'm very, very quick tour of the past. The past saw a major increase in food production, but at the expense of land. About 24% of land <coughs> has actually had soil degradation. That, the map shows very, the red is very degraded soil through to yellow, which is fairly degraded. Um, that's what happened in the 20th century. Big increases in food production, but at the expense of degraded land. In terms of fisheries, um, the expansion of fisheries that occurred in the back end of the 20th, 20th century as at the expense of terrible fisheries management. And many of the fishery, fish stocks of the world are very badly managed. The red is the worst managed fisheries, the green is the best, and you've got to look pretty damned hard to find the green on that graph. Um, and about a billion people rely on fish as their primary source. And forests, of course, this change in area covered by forests. We're all well, well aware of the gross declines in forest cover, which interacts both with in terms of climate. But in a sense, the response in the 20th century was if we need more arable land, we cut down forests to do it. Can't do that anymore because of climate change. And the energy production, well, we all know it, increasing energy production, which has been very successful, as at the expect at the expense of very, very dramatic increases in greenhouse gas production. And water. I said water worries me. Let me take the top left-hand graph for, uh, slide first. This is, north, this is India. And the northwest India, uh, the aquifers, the underwater supplies. Give you a flavour of it, and many in this audience know much more about this than I. Um, typically, water being used for irrigation in some of these areas um, from these aquifers is about 300 years old. So the water that has actually been used for irrigation is of the order of 300 years old. Manifestly unsustainable. And as you can see, the overexploited aquifers are shown as red, the green ones are already saline, and the blue ones are critical. Um, the bottom left hand um, thing shows um, some agriculture in Saudi Arabia based on aquifers, and I think the sustainability of that is pretty clear. Um, interestingly, Africa, with this massive expectation of um, population and increase in urbanization, has quite significant resources of underwater water. Um, the British Geological Sur um, Survey and others have looked at it, and there are very, very substantial resources in Africa which we can look to. Um, but it's, we cannot make the same mistakes that you saw in India. This has got to be exploited sustainably. And we don't actually have particularly good theories about how you exploit aquifers. You know, it's, you know, it should be a fairly straight 
point. And we need to be thinking about smart ways to actually conserve water in agriculture and other things, and the little illustration that point, points to it. The other thing is that, that we have a lot of waste. The right-hand side um, shows the losses um, before harvest of some of the main world food crops, maize, rice, potatoes and wheat, give or take about 30% um, of a crop is lost before harvest um, in the developing world. And about another 30% is lost in, in storage. That's the developing world. So a big, if you're going to affect waste, you have a real chance to improve things. The developed world is totally different. The developing countries show that, transport and processing and on-farm losses. In the developed world, most of the losses are occurring um, after purchase, at home or in the actual process. And we are losing about 30% 30, 30 of our food that is actually consumed is thrown away. And you were, you were aware of campaigns, you know, um, again, uh, all sort of two-for-one offers and so on, which need to be addressed. But that's something simple that actually could be done. So that's the past, but the real thing is we, the future cannot be like the past if we're going to survive in anything like the level of comfort that we have lived in, and quite often it hasn't seemed that comfortable um, for the last... Um, for the next few years. We need to be thinking in terms of sustainability, we need to be thinking about biodiversity, about ecosystem services, and we need to be thinking about the fundamental links between food, water, energy and climate change. And we need to be thinking about to do that. And the other thing that is happening is that because of the necessity of that we are going to see more dramatic events, we need to be thinking about how we deal with that. And by and large, our ability as a, as a human community to deal with um, threats um, correlates pretty much with development. And Cyclone Nargis in Burma killed about 140,000 people. Damage in cash terms was quite a lot. Katrina and Sandy, both in the USA, slightly smaller hurricane, was slightly larger hurricane in the case of Katrina, slightly smaller in the case of Sandy. Look at the Katrina, nearly 2,000 fatalities. Sandy, the most massive um, tropical storm, 200, but big damages. So development can actually do it, and one of the challenges we have for the world is to think about that. My final slide is saying up to 2050. Now, I've talked about climate change. I'm not going to repeat myself again, because I just don't believe we're going to do it. Um, I don't think we've got any chance of meeting two degrees. We're going to need to be thinking about it. Um, the, the, the challenges out there are two, two and a half billion more people, 70% of the world living in cities, migration to vulnerable areas are pointed in climate change happening, the basic requirements of food, water and energy, and the potential for increase with no policy change of greenhouse gas emissions making climate change worth. All of those are the challenges up to 2050. But the one I'd like to focus on in the last moment is population. There's three graphs here. The, the top right-hand graph shows three trajectories. One is the most likely scenario. The central one is the estimate from the World Bank of the most likely scenario. First thing to say is these... So the, the more pessimistic one with increasing children is the top one. Uh, no drop in fertility rate. The bottom one is a significant reduction in fertility rates. Notice, of course, in the point I made, that by and large irrespective of uncertainty about demography, you're going to get another billion by 2025 anyway. The three graphs are almost overlying each other. But we're at a tipping point because the central graph has quite optimistic assumptions about fertility. Um, it assumes that essentially there will be a decline in fertility measured by children per female. And it, that's hopeful. And if it does, if it happens, if those assumptions prove correct, then we are going to be looking at a world population stabilising about 10 billion, and that's livable with. On the other hand, if you don't see these reductions in female fertility, you're looking at something like the upper graph. So half a child per female, more than the current best estimate, will take you up by, even by 2050 to 10 billion, and 30 years later by another 2 billion. Now, this is, I really believe this is a tipping point for humanity. 
I think it's a tipping point in, because there are three things that affect female, fer female fertility. Prosperity, we know, you know we need to improve um, our, the way in which we address poverty, so we know that. But the two others, one is the education of women, and we know, and detailed um, sociological studies point to pretty much the, extra, the more time women spend in education, the less children they have. Quite dramatic um, correlations through all sorts of societies. And the final one is that we know that dropping fertility means that you've got to have the availability of contraceptive methods. And those are the three key things that if they aren't there, so if we fail to get to grips with female education or the availability of contraception or indeed prosperity, we are going to be not looking at a stabilisation of the world population. And I believe that moving up the one or two billion moves us into something that is, I cannot imagine, a sustainable society in 2050. However, 2050, what do I care about it? I'll be 105. <laughs> 2030 worries me because I don't, won't quite make 105. So, as I said, you are at least going to get a drink afterwards. I've depressed you all. You have at least laughed at occasionally at my jokes, albeit slightly ironically on most occasions. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>